Just a quick note before we get started that this is part of our Blast from the Past series, where we celebrate one of the incredible women in tech from our archive. And if you're a new listener or you're just looking to be inspired, dig into the back catalog. There are literally hundreds of stories to choose from. Enjoy the episode. I'm a big believer in Googling things and like just finding the resources that are out there and believing in yourself that you can learn something, even if you don't think it's something that would come naturally to you. My name is Espri Devora, host of The Women in Tech Show. The show means a lot to me. The reason why I wanted to create The Women in Tech Show is I wanted to create a positive piece of content, something where people can listen and say, if she can do it, so can I. I call it actionable empowerment. Every single episode, you'll hear the story of a fantastic woman in tech, from engineers to founders to investors to journalists to designers, all sorts of different females in tech who have thrived. I want to share their stories with you so that you can can know what resources, mentors, and life situations they accessed in order to get to where they are today. Enjoy. The Women in Tech podcast is an independent production funded by you, the community. To support Women in Tech, if you believe in the vision as much as we do, please consider going to womenintechpodcast.com. That's womenintechpodcast.com and just click on the contribution link to keep this podcast going. Thank you. Welcome back to the Women in Tech podcast. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. So excited to be here. It's my first time. I am at the WeWork Atlanta right now. It's so cool, the culture that WeWork is creating around the world. And I was blessed to meet this girl, Hannah. Hannah was recommended to me by a good friend in Wilmington, North Carolina, where I just was. Um, He said that she's one of the most talented women in tech and she is a must to meet. And I just was so hyped. And now she's here. And uh, yeah, go ahead and introduce yourself. All right. Um, Yep, I'm Hannah Wilson. Um, I'm a software designer right now. A business analyst is my tech term. But yeah, I design CRMs and I live in Atlanta. I actually moved from Wilmington, North Carolina about six months ago. So we, we kind of crossed paths there. So. Totally. Mm-hmm. And and you're 20. Yes, I am 20. That's I'm crazy. 21 in October. And you <laughs> and you started becoming an entrepreneur at what age? Um, well, I, I would probably say starting my podcast would be um, when I started becoming an entrepreneur. I was 17. You were um, 17. Before that, I like I had an Etsy store and um, I was doing I was working in business since the age of 12, doing part time work with my dad's software development company. And what skill sets do you have at this point? Um, at this point, um, I know graphic design pretty well. Um, Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator, um, Premiere Pro for video editing, slight like working knowledge for Premiere Pro. Um, and then for software design, I just do like user interface design um, using balsamic mockups is like the software balsamic. I use. Balsamic! Yeah, it's like <laughs> pretty, you know, sketching uh, wireframe type stuff. And uh, yeah, I work on a software development team who uses like PHP uh, database stuff. So I design the front end user face. Uh, interface for that. And how did you learn how to code? Well, I don't actually code myself. Uh, HTML and CSS, I do know some. According to like hardcore programmers, it's actually not coding because there's no interactivity. Um, so I've learned everything I know based on like um, table conversations with like my family about code because they code. Um, and just interacting with programmers. When you design for programmers, you have to know how the code works so that you can design something that's like efficient for them to code using the CSS and layout and database tables that we have. So I know concepts of coding um, pretty well. I just don't write it myself. Um, Everything else I've learned, um, lynda.com was a really great resource. Oh, cool. It's L-Y-N-D-A.com, right? Correct. Yep. L-Y-N-D-A.com. I think you have to pay to like have a subscription unless mm-hmm. your company has one. I actually have a subscription through my library in Atlanta right now, which is awesome. That's um, awesome. Very highly recommend. Wait, through your library? Exactly. I wonder if I have a subscription through the Santa Monica library. Maybe. I should look that yeah. up. It's kind of a perk, and um, I had to pay. I'm out of the zip code for the library. I had to pay um, $25 per year, but lynda.com alone like covers that. So very, very recommended. Um. Okay, wait. So the, there's so much to you. One, you started a podcast at an early age. You um, learned a lot about the tech world at an early age. And you got an amazing full-time job at an early age. What is your role right now? 
Um, so my rule right now, I am kind of everything that isn't coding in relation to software development. So I work with the software developer vendor. Um, I will do everything from taking requests. Um, unofficial title is Keeper of the List, which I think <laughs> sounds kind of like Lord of the Rings fantasy, right. which is why I like the phrase. Um, but any request, um, I, the, the sy systems I design are franchises, so we have hundreds and hundreds of users, probably thousands for one of them. Um, and so any request is filtered and gets to me if it's like a legit request to make a change to the code or to a feature or add a new feature, even bugs. Um, and so I keep track of all that, sort of like software manager um, or project manager. And um, also recently, like a few months ago, I implemented Scrum with our development team. Um, so oh, I was cool. like Scrum master. So I did that. Then of course I do the user interface mockups for new features, which involves talking with the stakeholders, um, getting feedback, doing iterations, and then giving it to the developers. Sometimes I help troubleshoot bugs and test, and then I also develop training, uh, screen capture tutorials, and like, videos. It's stuff. just insane that you know how to do all of this and know how to do this really well at 20. It's insane. Um, for those of the listeners that don't know, what is Scrum? Okay, so Scrum and Agile, I don't actually, I need to research the difference between the two and how they relate. But basically it's a way where you um, break your software development into small chunks. So instead of planning all up front, which would be the waterfall method, and you spec everything out beforehand, um, and then you code, and then you test, and you do it in chunks. Instead, you break it into a lot smaller pieces. So if you have like 15 features in the software you want to launch. Instead of designing all 15, then coding all 15, then testing, you're going to do one at a time. So we broke our software development into sprints of one week each. So at the beginning of the week, we would say, okay, here's our task load, what we could do. It's called the backlog. You're going to pick like whatever you think you can get done that week. Then you're going to get it done, get the entire, entire software process done all the way through from design through testing right. and making it live. So the reason why this is um, we picked it is because you get uh, feedback a lot faster and you can iterate a lot faster. So it's a like, much faster pace than waterfall method because there's a lot of chance you're going to like realize something later on in waterfall, but you can be like, oh, well, we've already passed the planning stage. What is so the waterfall method? It. So waterfall <laughs> method, um, <laughs> I actually haven't been on a software development team yet that uses it, but I know the concept. It's um, it's like, I think I heard a case study once um, where like the FBI had this massive project. They were working from bio, bio folders and um, it was really inefficient, like right. the way paper was being used so much. They wanted to move digital. And so um, they had a software development team come in and they specced it out like hundreds of pages of, of written specifications right. beforehand. Then they started developing and they just got stuck and they were not making progress. So then this other company came in and the guy leading it was like, I will design this for you for cheaper in like two years. Right. Just, uh, quicker and cheaper than the other company. And the FBI was like, I don't really believe you, but you're cheaper and we're stuck, so we'll go with you. Yeah. And um, this other guy used Scrum and like yeah. broke, instead of having hundreds of pages of documentation, which is Waterfall, um, they broke it up into small sprints and they iterated and the project went successfully. Um, and I assume the FBI is using that software now. I mean, it's just, it's my, let's start from the beginning. It's mind blowing how much you know. I mean, we were talking about this in an earlier conversation. Uh, first of all, the brand, the company you work for now is called Noble Brands and Correct. it's noblebrands.com. Mm -hmm. uh, in noblebrands.us. Oh, sorry. Noblebrands.us. We are noblebrands.com mm -hmm. or noblebrands.us. Um, one thing that I brought up early is that though you're 20, I think you are more than what every qualified mentor could be. If someone wanted to reach out to you right now because they're so inspired by you, like I am, how could they, how can they connect and say hello? Um, so my email address, my personal Gmail address, which you know anyone's welcome to email me at, um, is hananiah.wilson at gmail.com, which is um, H-A-N-A-N-I-A-H dot Wilson at gmail.com. Uh, and then my my website is just by Hananiah, so it's spelled the same way, just with you know B Y at the beginning dot com. And you were saying on your website, if I remember correctly, you have a blog post, and it talks about how when you started your podcast, set you got Seth Godin to be your first guest. 
That is correct. Can you tell us more yeah. about that? <laughs> All right. So um, when I was 17, um, me and my dad had this idea for me to start a podcast. And um, I really loved listening to podcasts. And I was like, sure, <laughs> I'll do a podcast because like I'm incapable of like consuming media and not wanting to replicate it myself, <laughs> which is a blessing and a curse. But yeah, so I was like, I'll start a podcast. Right. Why not? Um, <laughs> and so I wrote down a list of all guests I could have. I wanted the podcast to be for teenage entrepreneurs because as someone who was homeschooled and was working from a very young age, I felt like there was a lot of business literature for adults and podcasts right. for adults. I didn't, I could learn from a lot of it, but there wasn't anything I could relate to directly. And I was like, well, let's have a podcast where the host is a teenager and the guests are often teenagers as right. well. I really wanted that and I couldn't find it. And so I was like, I'll do it myself. And um, Seth Godin isn't a teenager, but I'd read some of his books and like he's very well respected in the business and marketing communities. And I watched a TED talk he did for young people. Um, and so he was on my list and I was like, well, I'm just going to email him because he <laughs> makes his email address public on his site. Um, and so I got his email address and I emailed him a couple short paragraphs like, hi, I'm Hannah. I'm starting a podcast. Um, I'm 17 and I want to do it for teenagers. And like I watch your TED Talk video and I think you'd be a great guest because right. of. And then I like quoted him. Yeah. And then I was like, thanks for your time. Um, you know, thanks. Hannah. Yeah. And um, I sent it and I did not expect to get a result. Yeah. Um, but about, I think it was, I forget if it was 20 minutes or like 60 minutes later, I actually had a response. So crazy. From a, from a different email address than the one I sent it to. So I guess he has his email yeah. like rerouting. Yeah. Um, and it was like very, very short sentence. It was like, yeah, I can do it. Does today work? <laughs> <laughs> and I read it, and I honestly thought it was spam to start with. Um, and I didn't, I was like, okay, I need some time to process yeah. this. So I didn't tell anyone about it for like minutes, like maybe even an hour after I got the email. I was like, mm, I don't know. I don't know. I was kind of like embarrassed, like even ask anyone, do you think it's spam? Because like not knowing if yeah. it's spam and if it's not, well, then yeah. Seth Gooden who emailed me, I was like kind of freaking out. Yeah. Um, and then finally I showed it to my dad and he's like, I think this is real. Yeah. <laughs> so I emailed back and I had so many exclamation points in my response. I was like, yes, great. Thanks. More fluent than that. More words, but that was the equivalent. And then I was like, does three o'clock work? Cause he <laughs> said like, let's do it now. But I didn't have any equipment <laughs> and I didn't have the setup. Yeah. Um, and he's like, yeah, that works. <laughs> and you're like, um, now yep. what mic do I use? Like, how do yep. I record it? Yep. Like, <laughs> I was so jittery. I was kind of like, I mean, I was <laughs> physically jittery. Yeah. Like that whole afternoon. And I was like opening Skype and downloading the recording software and testing it with my like really cheap USB headset. Right. And then I was like doing last minute bio research on him. <laughs> so I like know everything and like the exact number of New York bestsellers he yeah. had. Um, and then, yeah. And then I interviewed him and the final, we ended up talking for 20 or 25 minutes and the podcast was 15 minutes. It's so crazy. And I produced it and put it on YouTube and it was great. And did you, and you edited it too yourself? I did. Yes. And what did you use to edit? Um, I used um, Audacity, which is a free open source like audio editing program. It has um, basic features, but it served my purpose for the time I did the podcast. It's so it's so <laughs> rad. Um, so how did you get involved in technology in the first place? I mean, it's just wild how much you know. Um, you were saying your dad had a software company. Uh, what were the other influences in your life that uh, helped you? become who you are today mm -hmm. um so i would say definitely you know working with my dad's company we'd have business and software debates like every day about random things um as and a then, little girl as yeah as as a girl like around the dinner table my dad is a coder and my brother's a coder and um we would just i mean i would hear them talking about like php stuff yeah. around the dinner yeah. table it's super weird but you know yeah um and then my I, dad took me to business conferences as a yes, little girl okay that's another thing we did actually <laughs> yeah. we we went to a lot of business events around town yeah. um i didn't dress very fancy i was like you know a teenager in yeah. high school and so i had like my one business outfit i would wear yeah. i called it my business outfit <laughs> and i was like what was it what was it 
okay, so it was dra- gray pants, yeah. this black shirt with like this like w- embroidered white thing on yeah. it. It was very simple. <laughs> um, did and you pick it out yourself or did like your mom uh, or dad pick it out? I think my mom helped me. I was really not into fashion at all yeah. when I was younger. I'm still not into, obviously. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> t-shirt and jeans. Yeah, I have a t-shirt too. I'm, I'm trying to get better at it because yeah. I think your appearance like does matter. It, it, it does, does matter. some degree. No, it does matter. I, I look put together, just not totally overly fancy. Because people take you more seriously. So I have mm-hmm. a, just a side note, I have a really hard time dressing myself. It causes mm-hmm. me a lot of stress. That's <laughs> why so most of the speaking engagements I do, I wear a We Are La Tech shirt mm-hmm. and like colorful pants and colorful heels. <laughs> like that's my like work yeah. uniform. And I was meeting with my, a mentor of mine in Los Angeles, Deborah, mm-hmm. and she said, what you need to do is you, it's, it's a hack. You find a store that um, fits your body type well, and then you have the people at the store pick out different selections for oh, you. Oh, yeah. But you stick with those brands because you know they work well. So you kind of go on a hunt to find what brands fit you the best for maybe for jeans, for T-shirts, maybe it could be different brands for all of them. Mm-hmm. But then you go to the store and you have them pick out stuff, and then that's how you just know every time. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good idea. So I haven't tried. I She literally just told me that a few weeks ago, so mm-hmm. I want to start doing that because, yeah, I, I look like a slob everywhere. <laughs> yeah, also <laughs> Pinterest has been really good for me. Oh, um, that's a good idea. You can like find your style. Like I've actually found styles like with names that I like, and I never yeah. knew they existed before. Oh, cool. Yeah, and yeah. of course I'd dress steampunk every day if I could, but you know, <laughs> you have to like dress to society. Also. Well, it's not just society. Like there's this whole study for guys actually that if a guy a guy that wears a suit versus a guy that doesn't wear a suit, the guy that wears a suit even if he's not as competent of the guy that doesn't wear the suit, mm-hmm. like the guy that wears the suit will be taken more seriously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I've thought so. about this before and like people shouldn't judge me because of what I wear. Right. And I was freelancing from the age of 18 and so yeah. I would meet new clients who'd been referred to me. I got right. all my clients through referrals and I'd be like sometimes I'd be at a co-working space and a new client would come up yeah. I didn't know they were coming right and one day that happened I was wearing a gray hoodie yeah. a size large gray hoodie yeah I felt so sloppy and afterwards it kind of kicked myself I was like I need to like look presentable everywhere yeah. I go because you never know who you're going to meet. Totally. That didn't happen for me until I moved to Atlanta. And it's a work yeah. in progress for me. Talk to me about that move from Wilmington, North Carolina mm-hmm. to Atlanta, Georgia. That's a really big deal. Mm-hmm. Why why choose a job in a completely different state? You know, what is it like 6 hours away from your mm-hmm. family? Um yeah, what was that? Yeah, um so basically I, d- during high school, you know, I worked for my dad's software development company. I had this kind of hang up. Like, I wanted to prove myself outside of his company. I was like, maybe I don't actually know what I'm doing. I only have the job because he's my dad. Yeah. I just wanted to prove my that I to myself and to everyone that I yeah. can exist on my own in the business community. Yeah. So I actually started freelancing for a year and a half for graphic design and web design. Um, by the end of my freelancing, I honestly think I knew more business people around town than my dad did. And that like really meant a lot to me because right. all my clients came through referrals. I had to do no marketing. Um, and at a young age, that just means a lot when like people trust totally. you with their brand's image. Yeah. Um, and so then... While I was freelancing a year and a half in, I got a job offer just out of the blue from one of my dad's clients who I'd worked with uh, for the last four years um, part time through my dad's company. They were like, you want to move to Atlanta and here's all the money we'll pay you. And I was like, that's great. So um, I also like it because I'm still connected with my dad's company. I'm very familiar with their process and with the code they write but I'm still independent from it. Oh, so you're not a salaried employee. You're I a am contract. a salaried. Oh, you I are. A sal- I'm a full-time salaried oh, you're in, employee. You're independent from your dad, but still connected exactly. to your dad. Exactly. Now I get it. Yeah, so yeah. it's very interesting. So originally my dad was my dad, and he was my boss, and he was my coworker, because it's a small company. Yeah. Now he's the vendor, and I'm the client. Oh. Or, or no, yeah, it's kind of. I get what you're trying to say. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an interesting relationship. I understand. So, it's just still, yeah. still in the family. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um. So it's been, it's been good. Um. Now, how, how did you, you decided not to go to college, right? Correct. So why did you decide to make that decision? Yeah. Um. So I got really angsty about my decision in eleventh and twelfth grade. I was homeschooled. Um. I was working part time 
um, for in software development. And I actually started freelancing for graphic design during senior year of high school. So before I graduated, I had clients. Um, and I was thinking to myself, like, instead of just going to college because of ever, everyone does it, what's the reason for me right, going? Right. And what would I major in? That right. was also another thing I yeah. didn't want to go in is like, oh, I'm just going to go to go. And um, I, I thought that I would go for graphic design or for web design and software development. I was doing both of those things for money right. already at right. that time. Yeah. And I thought, it's such a fast-moving environment. Why would I pay four years to be in one place for four years right. when instead I can freelance, I can work for companies, and I can get real-life experience? Yeah. Um, especially since I had skills already, like marketable skills. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that's why I decided to not go knowing I could always go in the future if I wanted to. I'm only 20 now, so I could go if I wanted. Totally. Um, it's not too late. And uh, so two questions. One is how did you know how to set your rates? Yeah, that was something, um, I honestly was not very good at. I probably undercharged myself, um, because my clients, I think, got the best quality graphic design for the cheapest they're ever going to get in their life. Yeah. Um, but I I charged by the hour. Mm-hmm. I wasn't good at estimating, so I charged by the hour. And I just kept track of my time to the minute, and I invoiced based on how long, like just math equation, how long did I work times, you know, my rate, hourly rate. I did increase it over the year and a half. I increased it maybe three times. Mm -hmm. So I kept my original clients at the original rate. I thought they've been with me since the beginning. They're ongoing clients. I really enjoy them as people. So, um, but new clients, I would charge a higher rate. Only one time did I get pushback about my rate. And I think that's because they assumed I'd be dirt cheap, like minimum wage, because I was young. Young, which isn't fair. And, um, and then what did you use to track your time? What software? Um, so I actually used like a clone of my dad's, uh, database. Um, so I use like an internal thing. Ah. Um, I actually migrated to harvest though. Um, I think it's harvest.com. It's like a subscription based. You just create very easy. You have units of projects, you clock time per project. You can sort by work type, which is great if you want to track your meeting time separately from graphic design. And then you just generate an invoice at the end and take money through PayPal. Awesome. And then um, last question about this, and then I have another question, Mm -hmm. is uh, how did you encourage referrals? So I actually thought while I was freelancing, I kept thinking about why am I getting so many referrals? Because I didn't actually encourage them. I think people referred their friends to me because it's a small business community. Everyone knew each other. All the business. Yes. Wilmington, North Carolina. All the people knew each other. All the owners. It was kind of like a club. I was cheap, responsible, and fast. Mm. Um, And I think because of the cheap, especially like people just referred to me. Also, I was very quick to respond on email if they had a request. Um, even if I couldn't get to it right away, I would say, hey, I can't fit you in until, you know, next week or something. Um, but because of that, I think I was unusual because I was so young, I was willing to charge less. Did you so have they any, saw that. other than the, the one client that expected lower rates mm-hmm. in general, did you have pushback as you raised your prices? Well, I didn't. Or less referrals? Right. So um, I would say no. Also keep in mind, I was only doing this for a year and a half. So Mm -hmm. I didn't really have much data over time to show. Um, But I think I was still substantially less than any other established. Okay. So it was still a lower price. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, So huge question that I'm really excited to ask you Mm -hmm. is you're obviously, I, I particularly perceive you as being really brilliant. And uh, ambitious and and just prof- all all the things, <laughs> all the positive things. Thank you. Have you ever considered or desired joining, you know, the popular thing of um, one of these Y Combinators or tech stars or, you know, just joining a startup and being part of that whole movement? And, you know, even Y Combinator, I think, does this whole thing like, we'll pay you not to go to college. So has that ever crossed your mind? It has crossed my mind. Um, I definitely am familiar with, like, Y Combinator and... Recently, actually, I was thinking about, I feel like in college, that's your, that could have been a time for me to prove myself. Yeah. Either I have what it takes to be one of these Silicon Valley tech startup people, 
Or... I do think you have what it takes to oh, be, but just well, saying. You. Okay, <laughs> I'm a little biased yeah. at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Or or do I like keep having my you know just my projects that I do my my job in Atlanta. Um, I I can see I can see myself being one of those people. Um, I don't know. You actually. don't know. Yeah. So if if anyone listening is part of one of those <laughs> groups and thinks think that Hannah should be you know, involved in a startup that you're working with or are aware of, be sure to message her. Just let her know what opportunities are out there. Um, if she decides to pursue that, how can they connect with you again? Uh, my email address is wilson at gmail.com. And I'm also on LinkedIn, um, Hannah Wilson. Cool. Mm -hmm. And we'll include it in the, in the show notes as well. Mm -hmm. And so what would you say is one way that you overcome challenges? Mm, good question. Um, so I think for me, I, I went through a really stressful um, experience. I was a project manager slash UI designer for the launch of an entire portal when I was 17, about to turn 18. Yeah. Um, I had not enough programmer resources, um, and it was just a very stressful time for me. That was definitely a challenge. And I think what helped me overcome that challenge, because it honestly gave me a mental block about project management right. that is um, lasted to this day, um, is just realizing like the scenario I was in instead of thinking I'm not a good enough person because I couldn't figure it out. And I got really stressed realizing I had this against me. I had this against me and knowing that it's possible to like learn what you're not good at. Yeah. I've gotten so much better at project management in about the last year Mm -hmm. um, that I would not have imagined when I was 17, I would be capable of running so many software Mm -hmm. projects at one time um so just knowing that you can learn skills even if you're not good at them if i can mentally comprehend that i can deal with any emotion that's happening at the moment and just kind of push through that knowing it's going to get better amen i mean that's the whole reason why this podcast exists if if it's like believing in the possibility Uh, it's one of the things that i really admire about your approach to life in general is that you really work toward not having self-limiting beliefs, like taking the chance to email Seth Godin and be like, what's the worst that can happen rather than not emailing at all? What Mm -hmm. are some suggestions you can give us, some mindsets that we could adopt that you've applied that have really worked for you that everyone listening right now can can leave this podcast episode being like, oh, wait, I could do that too. Do you have Mm -hmm. some suggestions? Um, I think for me, a big thing is um, knowing how much information exists online. I am self-taught. I mean, besides like having my dad teach me a lot of stuff, I have taught myself a ton of things, everything from piano to like software design and graphic design, video editing. Um, Just try typing something into Google. Um, I'm a big believer in Googling things and like just finding the resources that are out there and believing in yourself that you can learn something, even if you don't think it's something that would come naturally to you. Um, And when you start learning something and it's like really, really bad, just know it's, it's productive crap. Like, <laughs> <laughs> even if what you're doing is terrible, just having faith that it'll get better if you keep working yeah. or if it doesn't get better, just be like, okay, this isn't for me. Yeah. I'm going to move on and do something else with my life. So just kind of like taking life as it comes, doing your best with what you're given and seeing what comes of it. And if nothing great comes of it, then it's okay. You're not someone who's meant to do something great, and that's all right. And trying to to suspend judgment on yourself. Yeah. Yes. Um, So I am am very analytically, and I can be critically minded. Um, So what I often do is I'll write a blog post, and I'll post it, or I'll just, like, do something, and I'll put it out there. And then, like, over the next couple weeks and months, I'll reread it a lot of times. I'll see things I can do better. So I think it's suspending judgment for enough time to do something. Yeah. And then you look at it very critically after that to judge and see how you can become better in the future. I love it. That's how I approach writing, at least. Mm -hmm. I just write stuff and stick it out there. And then I, I like, edit my blog posts so many times after I post them. It's kind of sad. I'm like, oh, I didn't (laughs) see that typo before. Um, But that's how I do things. I love it. I mean, I could I could talk to you all day long. I think you're incredible. I think that all you guys probably think that Hannah is incredible just as much as I do. Um, but it is a podcast episode. And I know you guys are like driving in your car or you're running on a treadmill and you're about to get off or you're doing the dishes and you finally hit that last dish. So um, I, thank you so much for being on the podcast. If you always want to see 
how Hannah interacted with Seth Godin. She wrote a whole blog post about it. It's true. So uh, your blog again? Yep. So my blog is um, byhananiah.com, B-Y-H-A-N-A-N-I-A-H.com. And I've actually uh, copied and pasted the exact email I sent to him. So that is definitely some incentive uh for you, to, for you to look at that totally. blog post. And before we completely wrap up, I really want to give a thank you and a shout out to my friend Matt. Can you tell us a little bit about Matt? Um, I What I will say is Matt, my friend in Wilmington, North Carolina, is who taught me how to build e-commerce sites. He taught me about fulfillment. We met years and years ago on an online forum, and we only met in real life this past week, and thanks to him is how I got to meet Hannah. So can you share a little bit that you know about Matt? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so I've known Matt. Uh, He and his wife and his daughters are family friends of of my family. Um, So he and my dad, you know, are good friends, and um, I think they actually worked together like years and years ago when I was, you know, too young to remember. And so I've just seen him around town, you know, in Wilmington and um, him and his wife are super great, very nice people. And then his daughters are about my age. Um, So I would just see them around. And then, you know, recently he messaged me about this opportunity with you. So it's It's awesome. Matt Matt is one of my favorite people in the world. Um, I'll include Matt's Twitter handle in the show notes, too. So I don't have to, like, pull away and uh, and look at my phone right now. But he's just such an incredible person. He had a skateboarding company back in the day and yeah, yeah. that's how we connected um thank you so much hannah for sharing yeah, your you. insights it's been a lot of fun oh my god you know i'm almost forgetting and i put it on the <laughs> table just remember okay wait <sighs> so glad i didn't forget so we're starting a new thing i mm-hmm. met a founder in wilmington north carolina mm-hmm. named sam she is awesome she created something called compass bracelet nice okay so compass bracelet is this trackable shareable bracelet And I feel like we can create a movement together. So how this works is I'm giving you bracelet 1858. And as you can see on the inside, it says share your compass, right? Mm -hmm. So what you do is I create, um, no, no. So you log in to share your compass Mm -hmm. and you say how you receive this bracelet. Ah. And then within two weeks, you give the bracelet to another woman in tech. And, And then that person needs to give it to another woman in tech within two weeks. And and all of you guys write on the shareyourcompass.com website how you received the bracelet. Isn't that cool? That is a super cool idea. And I Sam's like building it so later on, um, everybody who has the bracelet can like say hello to one another so you could track where your ah. bracelet's been. And um, all the listeners can follow the story for 1858, your bracelet on shareyourcompass.com. That is super cool. So cool, I right? Do, like do you have an idea in mind of, and it doesn't have to be in Atlanta, do you have an idea of who you're gonna give it to? Um, do they need to be in tech specifically? They do, it has to to okay. be a woman in tech. Yeah, I mean, Emily Ann Atkinson, I know her really well. You actually interviewed her very recently. Amazing. Um, she is is amazing. Yeah, I'm actually going to see her in a couple days. Yeah, tell us about Emily Ann. Yeah, yeah, so Emily Ann is... Um, She's just a really great person. She's very motivated. Um, she co-founded Kate for Women in Tech. Um, you guys can listen to her podcast and get the whole story. Yeah. But she's just very... She's very put together and very poised, and she's a real inspiration. Um, hearing her story of how she like got her first like database administrator job, she just went to Barnes and Noble and like bought every book they had. That just really like resonates with me as like a self learner type yeah. person. Um, and yeah, and so I worked with her very very closely. Her and um, Audrey Spiker, both they're both awesome. On a Cape Fear Woman in Tech in yeah. Wilmington, North Carolina. Do you happen to know? Does Cape Fear have a Twitter handle? Um, I think the best place would be the website to find updates. Yeah, so you guys, um, and we'll include any contact information. Our amazing teammate, Carl, will write in the show notes mm-hmm. um, and how to look up Emily Ann yeah. and Audrey. And I know they're on Instagram. Yeah, so. and mm-hmm. the Kate Bear Women in Tech for more information. Yes. But yeah, so that's where your Yay, bracelet will you. go. So remember to have Emily Ann mm-hmm. also fill in the share your yes, thing. And thank you to Sam for this partnership. Yeah. How cool is that? Like to track mm-hmm. a bracelet everywhere yes. it goes. Imagine yeah. when it's like a hundred women in tech deep, and you yeah. can see like it started with you. And the leather is all worn because we've been wearing so, it everywhere. So you know what's cool is this is um uh, it's cor- it's like leather cork. It's out oh. of Lisbon, Portugal, or it's Portugal. Real pork? Cork? So it's cork. Not yeah, pork. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's cork out of Portugal. So I actually uh-huh. interviewed women in tech in Lisbon, and mm-hmm. so this is leather cork. And oh, it's wow. gender neutral, which I think is really cool. So it's, it's leather and cork. Well, well, no, it's cork, but okay. it's made to look like 
leather. Yeah, because yeah. it definitely does look like leather. Yeah, that is it's very, so very cool, neat. right? Yeah, very I love it. Artsy, very artsy. For the tech and by the way, she yeah, makes it herself wow. it, at her house. Yeah, she nice. makes it herself, and it's just, yeah, I'm really excited about it. Cool. So I will talk to you guys. Hear you guys. See you guys in the next episode. Bye. Bye. Betalist, one of my favorite companies to gain exposure to your startup before you're even live. Go to betalist.com slash women in tech and get featured. Yes, get your startup featured while still in beta and make sure people know that you're about to go live. So when you open the floodgates for business, you'll be ready with pre-existing customers and signups. That's betalist.com slash women in tech. The Women in Tech podcast is an independent production funded by you the community. To support Women in Tech, if you believe in the vision as much as we do, please consider going to womenintechpodcast.com. That's womenintechpodcast.com and just click on the contribution link to keep this podcast going. Thank you.